Taking off in an airplane can seem simple, but if you watch new players in DCS, you'll see a lot of this. Want to know how you can nail the takeoff every time? In this video, we'll go over exactly how to do that. Whenever we're airborne, we see the four forces of lift, thrust, weight, and drag working together on our aircraft. We covered those forces in detail in these two videos. To get airborne, we'll want to do three things with these forces. Maximize thrust, maximize lift, and minimize drag. We do these things because there's a limited amount of runway for us to get airborne. So we need to get the most out of our aircraft if we want to get into the air safely. Today we'll be using our MB339 trainer to see how we do all of this. If you want to know how you can try out this trainer for free, check out this video. The first thing on our list is maximizing thrust. We can maximize thrust by pressing down on the wheel brakes while we advance the throttles to maximum. It might seem counterintuitive, so let me explain why this step is important. It takes time for a jet engine to spool up to maximum power. Piston engines can typically rev up faster, but jets might take a little longer. You can see just how long it takes the RPM needle to move to 100% after I've pushed the throttle all the way forward. If we didn't hold the brakes, then our jet would begin rolling at partial power. So part of our roll down the runway would be at less than full power. By the time we reached the speed where enough lift was generated to achieve takeoff, we'd be farther down the runway than if we'd made the same run at full power. Holding the brakes until the engine has fully spun up lets us make the trip down the runway with the most power while using the least amount of runway. This is how we maximize thrust. Now what about the second thing we want to do, maximize lift? If you remember back to our discussion about angle of attack, we know that increasing this value increases lift. But we'll have trouble doing that while we're on the ground where we can't tilt the aircraft upward. That's because the control surfaces we use for pitching the aircraft upward are located back here. These are known as elevators and they move when we pull back on the stick or push it forward. Elevators are placed as far back as possible from the plane's center of gravity to maximize the amount of rotating power. Just like how using a longer handle on a wrench gives you more twisting power. The elevators are attached to these non-moving parts of the aircraft called horizontal stabilizers. These also happen to be small wings that generate lift, so they need a lot of airflow to work properly. That's exactly what we won't have when we're on the ground just beginning our takeoff run. This is where flaps come into play. Flaps are a type of feature known as a high lift device that lets part of the airplane's wing extend downward like this. With the trailing edge lower, it moves the cord line of the wing into a higher angle. Remember that the cord line is this imaginary line running from the forward edge of the wing to this point at the very back. With the flaps extended, the angle of attack increases. Flaps let us change the angle of attack while we're on the ground where we can't rotate the entire aircraft. So as we're rolling down the runway, our deployed flaps will give us more lift. In our trainer, we can tell the flaps are in the takeoff position by looking here on the instrument panel. With the needle in the middle, we'll know they're extended down where we need them. The lowest position is what we'll use later on when we're ready to land. And the upper position is where we want them after takeoff. So let's get started and hold the brakes while we advance the throttle. Once the engine is spooled up as high as the brakes will hold, we'll release the brakes and start our roll. While we're going down the runway, we might see the jet veering to the side. This could be the result of wind or a tendency of some aircraft to slip one way due to their design. What we do when this happens is use the rudder to keep us aligned on the runway. That's why it's important to have the rudder controls handy. One thing you'll want to remember with the rudder is that it functions just like a wing. The only difference is that it provides lift to the sides instead of vertically. It needs a certain amount of airflow moving over it for it to provide effective control. So you might not see an effect from the rudder until you've built up some speed. You can see your speed here in this gauge which displays knots. Knots are nautical miles per hour which can be translated as 1.85 kilometers per hour or 1.15 statute miles per hour. In this series, we'll stick to using nautical miles for distance and knots for speed. The point at which you have enough speed to get airborne isn't a fixed number. It's going to depend on the weight of the aircraft. Remember that more weight means more lift is required and that means you need more airflow over the wing. So a trainer with just the pilot and half a tank of fuel will lift off at a lower speed than one with the full tank 
carrying as much as possible on the underwing stations. Or another way to put it is that a light aircraft will use up less of the runway getting airborne. If we look at our manual, it says that at max fuel in a takeoff configuration, we have a stall speed of 103 knots. So we're going to have to get above that speed to get in the air. Pulling all the way back on the stick, you can get off the ground just as you pass above 103 knots. It'll look like this. That's not very smooth, but there's another reason besides not looking smooth why we don't want to yank the stick like this during takeoff. We're just barely above the speed we need to get airborne right now. Remember that speed and angle of attack are related. When one goes up, the other goes down. So when we're barely above takeoff speed, our angle of attack is high. In fact, this is why we see what looks like little clouds forming here briefly. That substantial increase in angle of attack is causing a large drop in the air's pressure. That drop in pressure and consequently its temperature also means you can't hold as much water vapor. So that excess water is getting expelled into the air around the wing in the form of little clouds. Now you don't need to remember all that, but you should remember that seeing those clouds forming on the wing means that your AOA is high and you're getting a lot of induced drag as a result which will slow your aircraft down. That means you're headed towards your critical angle of attack and a stall if you don't get it under control soon. We went over induced drag in this video, but the bottom line is those vapor trails mean you're losing speed, which is important to lift. But as long as you gradually lift off, you'll continue to build speed to keep that smooth airflow going, and we'll keep angle of attack under control too. You do that by not being too aggressive with your pitch up for takeoff. This normally means you'll get off the ground at a higher airspeed and being a little farther down the runway, but it's also safer. When you gently pull back on the stick, you can expect to get airborne between 120 and 130 knots. Now that we're airborne and we've taken care of maximizing thrust and lift, we have one last thing to do. Minimize drag. The moment our wheels are off the ground, we have two things causing drag which we can control. First, we have our landing gear out, which is producing parasite drag. This one's easy to resolve. Press the G key to bring in the landing gear. Retracting the landing gear will eliminate their parasite drag. But there's one other potential source of parasite drag, and it's this, the air brake. When you start the aircraft from a cold and dark state, like we went over in this video, then the air brake will be out. And just like the name implies, it'll cause drag to slow down the plane. We obviously don't want that during takeoff. You can retract the air brake with the following hotkey. This instrument will let you know when it's all the way in. That should take care of our parasite drag, but we still have our flaps down in takeoff position. Remember that this increases the angle of attack of our wings. An increase of AOA also increases induced drag. So we want to pull those in once we have enough speed to stay airborne without them. We can pull the flaps up with the F key. Pulling in the landing gear and flaps will cause the jet to make some noise to let us know something is going on, but you should always verify that they've been pulled in completely. The flaps have their own instrument here. Make sure the needle is pointed up here, which we call the cruise setting. There are three green lights that come on when the landing gear is down. Ensure that all three lights are off, indicating that the landing gear is fully retracted. Remember, it's possible to damage the gear or flaps by flying with them deployed above 175 knots. If they get damaged, they may not fully retract. With the flaps and gear all up, we've now completed the task of minimizing drag and we're ready to fly. In the real world, there's usually a more extensive checklist of tasks to go over both before and after takeoff. This is because there are a lot of things that could go wrong and lead to an in-flight emergency. But in our sim, we don't need to worry about loss of life or damage to a real aircraft. So in this series, we're going to stick to things that directly relate to the lesson. Before I end this video, I want to talk about one control that will make your life as a pilot much easier. It's called trim, and in our trainer, it's handled by this four-way switch on the back of the stick. You can tell by its convenient placement that it's probably something that's used quite often. To understand what it does, we want to think back to the video where we talked about how lift changes with speed. Changes to lift made the jet's nose move up and down, so if you sped up the aircraft, then the aircraft's pitch would increase. This could be a problem on a long flight where you want to maintain altitude at a higher speed. You would spend the entire flight pushing against the stick to keep the jet in level flight. Wouldn't it be easier if you could just recenter the controls to this new pitch attitude? That's exactly what trim does. 
If the jet is pointed higher than where you would like it to be with the stick centered, then you could press up on the trim control. That moves the control surfaces to create a new center for the stick. Just tap on the trim switch until it gets to a place where you can let go while the jet maintains level flight. This will make your job as a pilot much easier. It also helps horizontally too. Let's say you're doing some air to ground training one day and drop ordnance from one wing. Now the other wing is going to dip because it still has weight pulling it down. You can trim that out too. Just use the left and right sides of the trim control. So take some time to practice trimming the aircraft. Speed up and slow down and see if you can trim it to a point where the jet stays level at your new speed when you let go of the controls. Here are the default hotkeys for trim but I highly recommend going into the control menu and mapping it to a hat switch on a joystick. It's far more convenient that way. We'll leave off here for now so you can spend some time getting used to the controls we went over. In the next video, we'll go over some common problems I see that mess up people's takeoffs and how to correct them. So I hope you'll return for that video, and thanks for watching.